first of all, welcome. Thank you very much for joining today's um, session. Oh, hello, Ben. Ben's back. Hi. <laughs> Um, so today's session on mar uh, maritime cliff tops and slopes um, is being provided to us by Ben Avaris. So Ben is an absolutely um, experienced both botanist, but also actually an MPMS trainer. Uh, Ben's been doing this with us for, for some time now, actually. Ben, been a couple of years, hasn't it? You've been helping us out training our MPMS um, volunteers. Um, so this forms part of our um, ongoing training programme that you can access the materials to and see past recordings um, on our MPMS support YouTube channel. Um, but of course, also welcome anybody else who actually isn't currently um, an MPMS volunteer with us. Um, and you're just looking to find out a bit more. I do hope the session might inspire you. There. Can you there hear you go. Me? Lovely. Yes, can Good. hear you perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, welcome to this uh, kind of introduction to the um, maritime cliff tops and slopes. And um, oh, I should remind myself actually when what when would you finish? So that because I've got a clock here just to kind of keep an eye on timing of things. It's um it's, it's an hour, isn't it? Yep. So it is an hour we have. Aiming for about to finish about one thirty by about one thirty. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is um, a brief um, only an hour sort of whiz around through this habitat and I'm going to go on to the um I should go on to the next page if I need to get the cursor just a second um, are you able to put it onto slide view there, again there we are um oh is it not on the slide view has it gone no off that? you need to no you need, just need to go down to the bottom and select slide view in the same place as before for oh, some yeah. reason it turned um, itself off slideshow that's the one perfect oh, yeah, thank yeah, you man. it comes up bigger brilliant so there we are and um that's just a title page with a photograph of some cliffs and another one. Just a brief outline there what, of the ordering of things in this presentation. Um, we can talk about definition of this um, uh, of maritime cliff tops and slopes in MPMS terms, the different kinds of vegetation that we find in these places, and um, and then a closer look at different kinds of um, species of individual plant plant species that we get there. Um, and this is well, that's that's actually the original um, what do you call front cover thing that I did myself before it went into the MPMS style. So forget that. And that one that's just basically saying what I've just said. <laughs> There's a picture of some cliffs, and it's saying that we're going to be looking at some of the habitats and the species, including oh, all including as I mentioned here, um, all the species that are listed um, as MPMS positive and negative negative indicators. In these sorts of places. Um, so starting with definition of the habitat, what do we actually mean by maritime cliff tops and slopes? And of course, there's the MPMS guidance to refer to, which is what I've done there and um, copied out that bit of text um, from it, which basically is telling us that it's um, for the most part it's um, grassland and heath kind of vegetation on these coastal slopes between the, the top edge of the cliffs, um, going back to any kind of fields or obvious boundaries in the land, and then the other way going obviously down to the bottom of the cliffs. Um, and also that some particular kinds of cliff habitat we're not really dealing with here. Some things that are that's kind of like seriously really steep and vertical, well, you know, for safety reasons, you can't be expected to be going on there. Um, so there's a little bit more here about um, over the next few pages about these two things I put with bullet points there, the range of vegetation types that can be included here and um, the where we define the inland limits, because it's good to be as clear as we can about these things. So first, vegetation types, and as the guidance said, um, grasslands and heaths. And, but of course, we do get other kinds of vegetation on these coastal slopes. There's woodland and scrub and kind of underscrub, things like bramble and raspberry. Those actually fit better into the NPMS broadleaf woodland um, category. So we, we don't really bother with those here. Um, flushes and fens, likewise, they go into a different one, the, um, the marsh and fen type. Uh, of course, a lot of the cliff um sort of places are just too steep for things like flushes and fens to occur anyway 
Uh, we also get in some places a lot of bracken and, and other tall ferns and um, greater woodrush, patches of those kind of big plants growing on steep cliffs, especially as, um, some of them like greater woodrush and the, some of the other tall ferns, not bracken, but the other tall ferns are very palatable to um, animals such as deer and sheep. And of course, the maritime cliffs are places where they can't really go very much, very easily. So these kind of plants can do quite well in those places. And there's no other real place in the NPMS for them. So they can be long in here as well, as can herb dominated vegetation that overlaps a bit actually with the grasslands. Um, because some of the, the, the maritime cliff NVC grassland communities and some some of the calcareous grassland communities Actually, when you look at them, you find there's as much or more um, in the way of herbs than there is of grasses. So we don't always they, they go under the name grasslands, but um, some of them are actually largely herb dominated or actually um, kind of miniature um, dwarf shrubs. If it's a lot of thyme or rockeries, because they are actually called dwarf shrubs. We'll see some pictures of those later on. Um, another one finally is ivy. This this um, got missed in things like the national vegetation classification, and there's no clear place anywhere, um, any clear other place for it in the M NPMS scheme. And you do get some quite big patches that are quite distinctive on some sea cliffs, so that could be long in here as well. There's quite a range of vegetation types that we can find. Um, and so a quick summary of those. Grassland heath, bracken and other tall vegetation, tall fern vegetation, greater woodrush, um, herb stuff that isn't flush or fen, and big patches of ivy. All of those can be counted in MPMS, maritime cliff tops and slopes. Uh, and if you're interested in the national vegetation classification, which is a great thing, and it always makes vegetation more interesting to, to, to be looking at it through the eyes of the NVC. Then there's a brief list there of the main um, NVC communities. The M uh, NPMS guidance does have something about um, equivalent NVC ones, and it has um, has a list of those that I've put in that first paragraph there, but there are others also that can be long in NPMS, maritime cliffs and slopes, so I'll put those in as well. Um, so let's go on here. That was a bit about definition then of the in terms of vegetation types, the range of vegetation types we can find um, in, in this NPMS category. Um, the other thing I was going to try and sort of clear up as much as possible is where we would draw the inland limits. And very often it's pretty clear. Um, here's an example. There's um there's a, a, a fence line with fields inland. From um, from that cliff top area, the, so you've got the top of the cliffs, and then it goes on inland for a little bit with heathland vegetation, which can be counted in the MPMS maritime cliff top and slope. Um, and then there's a fence, and beyond that, we're into um, fields, agricultural, agriculturally improved fields. So, a place like that, it's fairly distinct. That dotted line, by the way, at the left, is just simply because the fence goes behind that near horizon of heathland. Um, here's another example, generally a more grassy landscape. This is in southeast Scotland, not that far from where I live. And um, there's, it's all very grassy, but the grassland on the left is agriculturally improved fields with a clear fence line. So um, in some places that comes very close to the top of the cliffs. Other places it goes a bit further inland, but everything on the seaward side of that fence is best counted in MPMS, maritime cliff top and slope, and the stuff to the um, left um, side of it, so excluded. Um, another example, this is one where it's maybe not quite so clear, and there will be plenty of places where the inland boundary of this, um, this type um, category is not really obvious and clear. Um, because you could, you could say maybe about those points A and B that I've labeled there, where there's an obvious change of slope, but the slope immediately upslope of points A and B is still pretty steep, especially above B. And then it gets steeper, even higher up to C. And so really it would seem sensible to include all of that in the maritime cliff top and slope. And um, probably to take a line from X through to Y, which actually on my screen is um, 
covered over by the picture of me and the plant life on just beneath it. But right, so look, that dotted line, that little white dotted line, um, for simplicity, everything downslope of there would probably be fair enough to count within this habitat. Uh, there's another one coming up, a couple actually. Here, we've got some flattish ground extending for a long way inside inland from the clifftop edge. So basically just taking the clifftop edge as the um, inland boundary. Um, otherwise, if you went to start, started going inland, how far would you go? Because there's no fences. It's just um, unfenced land going um, going in there quite the same. So clifftop basically would be the, um, the way to define it there. Um, here's one where it's urban land, because the guidance also mentions if it's uh, residential properties and so on. Um, and here they come fairly close, not dangerously close, fortunately, but pretty close to the clifftop. And the um, the edges, the fence line along there, edges of people's gardens and things, would be the, um, the boundary of, of this MPMS type. Um, so, oh, down at the bottom end, um, mostly, of course, the cliff tops go down, the cliffs go right down to the sea. But in some places, there are other kinds of habitats in usually a narrow zone between the cliff top and the sea itself. Here's an example where it's actually a surprisingly wide zone of some kind of fen, Phragmites fen. Um, so you can get salt marshes in some places, you get a mix of other kind of habitats, salt, other things like salt marshes and um, even bits of sand dunes. Um, so that's a bit about the the um, definition of where the um, MPMS maritime cliff and slope ends on the inland side. Uh, and so now we can um, have a look at some uh, examples of different vegetation types. So pic pictures of some of these vegetation types that were partly referred to a bit earlier on, different kinds of grasslands and heaths and so on. Um, and the grasslands are quite varied. So the heat's a bit, but the grasslands kind of are more, there's a bit more obvious visual variation among the grasslands than there is among the heaths, because the heaths all, the coastal heaths all look kind of pretty much heather dominated. Um, and um, here's one um, type of coastal grassland where you get a lot of thrift growing with other species such as red fescue. Um, I've put the MVC types here, by the way, this is MC8, which is Festuca rubra, Armeria, Maritima, Grassland, lovely stuff. Um, that's one of the one of the commoner types of maritime cliff grassland that we find in these places. Um, and here's another one, not quite so colourful, really, because it's plantains, it's another kind of... Um, Festuca rubra um, type of grassland, but with a lot of sea plantain in it. You get it on a lot of rather exposed um, cliffs and cliff tops. Um, quite nice vegetation. We'll have some closer photos, by the way, in a wee while of things like sea plantain and the thrift and lots of other species, because I've mentioned the sea plantain there, but you can't really see it very clearly in that photo, but we'll get a closer one later. That's in the Outer Hebrides. Um, and um, quite a different one here. Some of these places have got soils that are really thin on very stony ground and just a patchy mix of wee things like stone crops and tiny grasses and um, some thyme in this example as well. It's, um, it's a bit like um, some of the um, acid and some of the calcareous grasslands that we find further inland. Uh, there's an acid grassland type called in the MVC called U1, which is a rather weedy, patchy thing with a lot of exposed stone in it. And some of the lowland calcareous grasslands are similarly very dry and very thin soils and bits of exposed rock quite commonly in them. Um, so there's a lot of floristic overlap between that and the coast, a kind of coastal version of it, which in the MVC we have as a community called MC5. A lot of little tiny herbs in it. It's lovely stuff. It's, it might look a bit kind of bit kind of weedy and um, as if there's not very much there, but there is quite a lot of species richness can be quite high in these places. Um, here's another example. Again, this is um, on very, very thin soils. This is, that, this is actually a calcareous grassland um, in the sort of strict plant community sense or like the MVC, National Vegetation Classification sense. 
there's a lot of thyme and there's a lot of rock rose there, both of which are little dwarf shrubs. And you can see all the leaves of the rock rose forming a low mat there. And there's also um, some leaves of uh, some little rosettes of ribwort plantain, the plant of carline thistle. We'll have another photo of that later on. Um, so that's, that's a, in the MBC sense, that's a type of calcareous grassland. It happens to be on, on a sea cliff, which is why we would class it here as MPMS, Maritime Cliff and Slope. Same community occurs way inland in quite a lot of places in southern Britain. And there we would have it down in um, MPMS, lowland grassland category, quite different. Um, what's next? Um, neutral grassland as well. Uh, you can get some some of that on these um, these sea cliffs, these steep slopes. Uh, very herb rich, lovely stuff. And um, the same kind of vegetation in land um, would be counting as a kind of um, neutral grassland, inland uh, lowland neutral grassland in the MPMS sense. But uh, where it, where it occurs on these steep slopes by the coast, we count it in the, in the maritime cliff top and slope type. Um, likewise, here's another example of a neutral grass and a rather taller one, quite herb rich, it's got some bluebells in it um, and red campion, um, rather a kind of woodlandish element in the flora there. And um, again, this kind of vegetation can uh, be found here and there inland, so uh, where it would count obviously in a different category neutral grassland really. Um, but here it will be uh, in the MPMS maritime cliff top and slope, um, as will this one. You see how varied all the vegetation is in these places. Uh, we've got a mix there of coarse neutral grassland, species poor stuff, a bit floristically, a bit like the stuff that you get along a lot of roadsides where it hasn't been mown or grazed very much. And you get grasses such as the false oak grass, our anathalum, which we see in the foreground there, um, being dominant. Well, Cox is another grass that you get a lot of in these places. There's a picture of that coming up later. Um, and then behind there, we've got a mix of bracken and um, bramble. So all of this can be accommodated within the same coastal cliff type in the MPMS. Not that you'd really perhaps want to go sampling too much in amongst the tall, thick um, bracken and bramble stuff. It might be quite tricky to sample. But although if your point lands you there, um, then um, one shouldn't, I suppose, be, be too biased and just not go into places because you don't like the look of them. Um, what's next? Heaths. A few photos of heaths here. Um, as I said before, just a while ago, they're largely heather dominated. Um, and in that sense, they can all look much of a muchness. But there's a bit of variation. A lot of them have a lot of bell heather in them. You can see it in the foreground there. Um, so there's another picture coming up of some more. This is also heather and bell heather heath. This is a community H10 in the MBC that floristically this kind of vegetation, if you did it on a small scale, it could be inland or on the coast, whereas the one just before, I'll go back to it, that one has actually got some maritime species in there, the um, the sea plantain and the thing called spring squill. Um, so even if we were just looking at a very small area, we would think, hey, this is kind of coastal heath, as it is in the MBC, that's H7, which is a strictly coastal kind of heath. Um, there's some more, there's some more H7 here. This is one that's got a lot of um, empetrum, crowberry. That can become really quite common in some coastal places, just as it can up in the hills, especially in the north of Britain. Um, it's, it's largely a pretty upland plant, but down by the coast, you know, it's, you know, the soil is quite thin and it's pretty windy. Um, there's an element of an upland climate in a lot of coastal places, especially in the north. And you can see some sea planting growing amongst it there. So that's another coastal heath. Um, and here's a wet heath that's also a coastal one. Most of the coastal heaths are in dry heath. If we have, when we split heaths into two broad categories, dry and wet, um, most of the coastal stuff is dry. But here's a wet one. So it's got a lot of uh, cross leaved heath. That's how we can tell. That's why we would call it wet heath. And it's a kind of form of this H7 community in the MBC, and it's strictly coastal because it's got some um, some maritime species scattered about in it as well. Over here, including some sea plantain. Um, of course, wet heath, like dry heath, it goes a long way inland as well without maritime species, and then we're into the um, the MBC 
heathland types. Okay, um, here's some woodland on a cliff, which we um, would have in NPMS broadleaf woodland rather than maritime cliff, but really I don't think we would want to be trying to sample in that woodland anyway, because it's too steep, just for safety reasons. Um, there is some stuff there that would count as grassland, but that's too steep, really, to be safe. Um, talking about safety, there's the NPMS guidance about taking extreme care blah, and so on. Uh, because these are pretty dangerous, um, can be dangerous places. It's a pretty scary looking um, view, that one. I was down on the North Devon coast years ago doing some bryophyte survey nearby. And I just had a look around this place and thought, wow, look at that. Okay, um, then um, some plant species, some individual plant species. A uh, quick whiz through quite a lot of them. And I've chosen these species partly to include all of those that are listed as um, positive or negative indicators for the MPMS, maritime, cliff, top and slope. Um, but quite a lot of other ones as well uh, that are not listed because they still grow there quite commonly and they some of them may make up the bulk of the vegetation, actually maybe more common than the positive or negative indicators. Um, and so it's it's worth including them here. Uh, that's a nice picture there, it's some bit of a bottom of a cliff with some um, geranium sanguinium, the bloody crane spill, which I've got a closer photo of that later on. Um, here on the Durham coast. So starting with red fescue, because this species is hugely abundant along um, so much of our coast, not just on sea cliffs, also in salt marshes and sand dunes. It's a really common species everywhere in Britain, really, in Britain and Ireland, inland, every, wherever you go, especially on neutral soils. But um, when you get right along the coastal fringe, it becomes particularly abundant in such a wide range of uh, different kinds of environments. So it's, uh, it's worth starting with that one. Uh, quite distinct with its little, it's, it's wiry, thin wiry leaves. There are a few other grasses you might um, understandably confuse it with, like sheep's fescue, which is smaller, has got shorter leaves, um, shorter flowering stems, and um, the leaves up the flowering stems are thin and wiry, whereas in the red fescue, they've got a little bit of width to them. They're not actually, they, they've got a sort of more of a, an upper and lower surface discernible, as, as in a lot of other grasses. Uh, that's one way of telling those two species, as well as the actual overall size. And mat grass is very distinct because it has wiry leaves as well, but it's very, very stiff, um, and the blades stick out very sharply at about a right angle from the, the sheathing part lower down is unmistakable and it's really, really dense tussocks. Um, you don't get as much mat grass on the coast as you do red fescue. And another one that looks quite similar is wavy hair grass, uh, which is mostly in acid places. And that's about the same size as sheep's fescue, but it's different in that it's got a ligule that's, um, the ligule, this little tiny flap thing that sticks up at the base of the leaf blade. And in the wavy hair grass, it's a few millimetres long, so you can actually see it. Whereas in the red fescue and the sheep's fescue, it's so incredibly short, it's virtually invisible. And the flower head looks very different as well. It's, it's got this much more opened out with um, longer branches and much more airy kind of look about it. Um, so red fescue, first page, very common one. And um, two of the herbs that I've mentioned earlier on, thrift and sea plantain, particularly coastal species, although actually they do occur inland, uh, in mainly in rocky places up in the hills, um, in uh, mountain tops, places like that. Um, they've both got very narrow leaves. Obviously, when they're in flower, you can tell them easy enough. The thrift's got those little round um, blobs of pale pink flowers, very distinct, and the whole plant's quite tufted. And the sea plantain's got that long, um, sort of dull green, typical plantain style head. Uh, but if they have got the flowers, it's just, it's just the leaves, then they're quite similar between both species, kind of long and, um, and narrow, and parallel sided. But you can tell them apart because the thrift leaves have got a kind of groove running up the middle of the upper side. You can see that dark line there in the, in the photo. I can put the curse on it, can I? 
yeah there we are if you, if you can see the cursor same as me um sort of dark line whereas in the sea plantain um, the leaf is a bit broader and it doesn't have a sort of narrowly cut in groove it's like from the one side to the other side of the upper surface of the leaf it just comes in a, a gradual like a wide valley or something you know just a, 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 a gentle dip um so it's a um it, you don't get that line running along the upper surface along the middle of the upper surface um it's a bit more kind of it's a bit more bulky and a bit more fleshy textured as well as the leaf of sea plantain not as fine and narrow as the that of thrift and they're both very very common on well-drained ground along the coast and they both grow not just in um it is along the coast they're not just on sea cliffs they can also be very very common in salt marshes okay another couple of plantains to follow on from the sea plantain the buckshorn plantain is another coastal one uh it's really easy to tell because it's got those sticking out lobes in little pairs opposite opposite each other um otherwise apart from those lobes it's basically a kind of fairly linear leaf and it's really pretty hairy and it's quite small on the whole average is smaller than the um sea plantain which can get quite bulky really the um the buckshorn plantain you often just see these little very low low rosettes flat against the ground um unmistakable because of those little lobes and the ribwort plantain which is really really common in land as well it's a much more well-known species and its leaves are broader very kind of uh like a narrow a very narrow oval or kind of elliptical one might call it and they've got veins running parallel all the veins run parallel which makes it in that sense it might look a bit like some kind of orchid but um it's hairy and orchids leaves are not hairy so ribwort plantains will be very easy to identify if, if even if you've just got the leaves um the there's a grass there yorkshire fog that's very very common um in a lot of the maritime cliff grassland um growing with the red fescue in fact the two species grow together co-dominate in a national vegetation classification category called mg uh, mc9 i haven't got a photograph of mc9 here but i've seen I'll show you photographs of red fescue and here's a photograph of yorkshire fog and if you imagine the two growing together um that can be that community but they also do grow together in land as well very commonly it's just in the mc9 there's also things like sea plantain and thrift growing with them which makes it a different community but on the in the mpms maritime cliff top and slope type um we we don't have to always have the maritime species like sea plantain or thrift for the vegetation to count in there so um you can get very species poor grasslands as i showed you that one with the false oak grass the, the kind of community that you get along roadsides and the bracken stands and so on some of these don't you know you can grovel about in them and you won't find um particularly strictly coastal species in them but they still belong in um, in this mpms category yorkshire fog's very easy to identify generally because it's got um it's got rather broad leaves and kind of thick textured flower heads the, which look different when they're opened out to when they're closed as you can see there's both in that photo often with a pinky tinge pale pinky purpley sort of tinge and uh, the whole plant is really quite sort of softly hairy with a nice velvety sort of texture um and the um the closely related creeping soft grass looks pretty similar but the individual um bits in the flower heads little flower florets in the spikelets there have end in, in long kind of hairs called horns in creeping soft grass and the Yorkshire frog doesn't have them and the creeping soft grass is the one that people call hairy knees because the little nodes at the tops of the leaf sheaths as you look down the stem there they've got little cluster of white hairs on them um you don't get that um that sort of definite little southern cluster in the Yorkshire frog the Yorkshire frog some people call it stripy pajamas because the lowest leaf sheaths very commonly have vertical striping of a kind of whitish and purpley pink and I think people used to well I don't think I know from <laughs> past that people used to have well maybe still do pajamas made um made in those in that kind of color with stripes you know some of those horrible old nylon things um anyway that's Yorkshire fog 
um, Blorca sedge is one of the commonest kinds of sedge that you can find on these coastal um, steep slopes. And it's one of those sedges whose leaves are distinctly grayish, um, bluish grayish tinged. Um, the other two are commonest ones with that tinge are um, carnation sedge, Carex panacea, and common sedge, Carex niger. But um, when they got the flowers on, the Glauca sedge is really distinct because the, the female spikelets, they're like catkins, they are on long stalks and they hang downwards, and the male ones, um, up at the top of the stem, there are two or three of them, whereas in the carnation sedge, there's only one. And the carnation sedge and the common sedge, the female spikes all point upwards, they don't hang down. There are a number, a number of differences. Um, so any kind of greyish green looking um, or bluey green looking sedge in these coastal places is most likely to be the Glauca sedge, more likely than the carnation sedge or the common sedge. Uh, what's on the next page? Oh, those two grasses. The Aranathrum, the false oak grass that we get along those roadsides. Here's a closer picture of it. It's It can get quite tussocky, um, big tussocks of long, broad leaves. Um, and often growing with it is the coxfoot, which is also shown here. It also gets very tussocky. It's got a, a tougher sort of texture. And the leaves are rather keeled, especially the sheathing part of the leaf is so strongly keeled that the whole bottom of the shoot there is flattened, has flattened look like it's been squashed laterally. So it's actually really, really distinct, um, if only for that reason. And once you've got the flowers on there, that is big blobby flower heads, it's unmistakable. Um, both species very common on a lot of our coastal slopes. Um, a quick, a close look at those main dwarf shrub species that we find in the heaths in these places. Heather is the one with the, the Kaluna, it's the one with the very smallest flowers and the smallest leaves. Both flowers and leaves are really tiny. Uh, bell heather, the leaves are longer and thin and they can come in whorls of three. And the flowers are bigger and they're a brighter colour. And the crowberry is a bit, the leaves are a bit like the leaves of the, the bell heather, but they're thicker and they've got a white stripe on the underneath. Um, the flowers are sort of not so distinct, really kind of dull, pale the flowers, and they have black, black colored berries, which you can eat. Um, but the leaves that make it really very distinct and say that they're, they're kind of thicker, um, much thicker leaf than the really relatively fine, narrow leaves of the bell heather. Um, um, some herbs now, flowering herbs. These ones are all in the pea family, a couple of clovers and a couple of other ones. Um, and we can all get them all on these coastal um, cliffs and slopes. White clover and red clover are pretty familiar to a lot of people, really, especially white clover, which is so common um, in all kinds of places, of course, including lots of agriculturally improved grasslands, where it's not always seen um, as, as a brilliant thing from a conservation point of view, because maybe it's been maybe it's part of a reseed or something that's taken off where a lot of fertilizer has been applied. Um, but um, it's very distinct because those little leaves with the three leaflets, each leaflet is very broad and rounded, and you can get a sort of pale blotch in the middle as well of, of the leaf of, the, of each leaflet. And the flowers, the familiar um, white flowers, and the whole plant can form carpets of, of leaves, all quite short, really, in those flowering stems sticking up. Whereas the red clover doesn't form big carpets, grows taller and more branched. The um, the leaves aren't all just down at ground level, they come up the stems a bit more, and the leaflets are longer and narrower and they um, and, and more pointed. And then when you've got the flowers, it's easy as well because the flowers are pink. Um, the zigzag clover I've mentioned there is a bit similar, but the flowers are a bit more of a rich, slightly more kind of deeper reddish pink, and the leaves don't have the pale blotch. It's quite distinct, it's a very, very neat plant actually, is zigzag clover. Those, those leaves without the pale blotch um and uh, there's something about them is the trifolium medium and, it for, and, and those leaves actually do form carpets in the zigzag clover quite extensive um and then the flowering heads sticking up on these these taller shoots it's a wonderful plant but you can get all three of those on coastal slopes uh bird's foot trefoil very very common in so many well-drained um places where the soil is more or less neutral or a bit calcareous 
not surprising that it grows very well on, on a lot of coastal sloops as well because they can fit the bill as far as that that kind of environment is concerned um, especially if there's a lot of space like if it's a bit rocky or the vegetation is short and fairly grazed um, leaflets in threes but you get two stipules at the base of each leaf so it looks like they come in fives and they're slightly grayish tinged um, and the yellow flowers are very, are very quite prominent. The um, kidney vetch also has yellow flowers. They're going over a bit in this photo. But the um, leaves, which have these quite big leaflets, um, are really distinctive because they're kind of white edged and they're very, they're very pale underneath. And that pale colour comes right around, around the edge, like someone's drawn it with a, with a pen. Um, which is what I've done there, actually. <laughs> I did a drawing of it for an art project about some sand dunes in um, East Sutherland. So um, um, I put the small blue butterflies in there because this is one of the food plants of that species. And it's quite a special butterfly. Um, and I've made them a bit yellow. That's actually based on the same bit of the same photograph, the one back there. And I've cheated and I've, I've brought them back into flower imagining what they would look like if those flowers were still more yellow. Um, so it's very, very common on a lot of um, cliffy slope places along the coast and inland. Um, the, here's some more things we get in these places. The ladies' bed straw. It's one of those bed straws, you know, the leaves come in whirls. Um, whirl, and then as the stem goes up, and there's another whirl. Um, ladies' bed straw has more leaves to a whirl than most other bed straws, up to eight or 12. And the leaves are very, very narrow like almost like little conifer needles, and the flowers are in yellow spikes at the tops of the stems, unmistakable. Yarrow, we often see it with just the leaves, like in that right-hand picture there, and that's pretty easy to identify, really, really cut up into little narrow segments. Um, but the whole thing is quite long and narrow, and then when it's got flower heads, they're very, very, very distinctive as well, these little, little sort of like umbels, really, of white flowers. And the stem is rather stiff, it's a nice plant. Um, and sea campion has these kind of um, greyish, pale greyish green leaves, very simple shape, and white flowers, a bit like flowers of white campion or bladder campion, which you also get inland. Bladder campion looks just the same, and the, the leaf is very, very similar. It grows inland, whereas sea campion is mainly coastal or on mountains in some places as well. Um, but bladder campion is an upright thing, and the sea campion is a spreading, low spreading thing. Sea campion's flowers are bigger than the white campion's flowers, and uh, than, the, than the bladder campion's flowers. And bladder campion, be, it's up that tall stem, the, the white flowers come and they often droop down a bit. Whereas in the sea campion, they don't, well, it, it doesn't grow tall enough for them to have much point in drooping down. Um, so, and, they, and, and they're really in different places. So anything like this along a coastal cliffy kind of place is gonna be sea campion really, those pale leaves pale locust colored leaves and white flowers. Um, buttercups you can get in these places too. All three of the main common species, the meadow and the creeping and the bulbous. If they've just got, if you've just got the leaves, the meadow buttercup, um, it's a it's a palmate, um, palmately lobed leaf. Whereas in the creeping, it's like there's a hole in the middle there because it's actually divided into leaflets two on the left and then a stalk goes on a bit more and then there's one on, one in the um, front at the end. Um, and the bulbous buttercup leaf is the same as creeping buttercup, but when it's in flower, you can see that photo on the right, the sepals underneath the petals are turned down. They start to come out and then they suddenly turn down. It's like they make a kind of pedestal really for the petals to sit on. Whereas in the other two species, the petals are going like that and the sepals are just from the same shape just underneath them. Um, so they can all occur in these coastal places and it's great to have especially the meadow buttercup and the bulbous buttercup that's the least common of those three the creeping buttercup can often do very well in places that have been a bit eutrophicated but nutrient enriched and that that effect of nutrient enrichment can um, encourage some species like creeping buttercup and other things rather at the expense of some others so it's not always the best thing to see evidence of a lot of, of eutrophication so creeping buttercup isn't always the best thing however having said that you do find creeping buttercup cropping up um, here and there in in quite decent vegetation that doesn't seem to be suffering badly from eutrophication anyway so it's not always baddie 
um, scurvy grasses. They've, these have got slightly fleshy textured leaves and heads of white flowers, sort of elongated heads of white or whitish, because they can be, in the case of the Danish scurvy grass, they're pale pink. The most common one that we find on these coastal cliffy places is the common scurvy grass, Cochlearia officinalis. Um, the English scurvy grass is mainly salt marshes. Danish scurvy grass, though, that can be in rocky places on the coast as well. And that's one that's the one that's spread in the land all over the place along roadsides, these little whole swords bit with pale pink flowers. Um, so slightly fleshy textured leaves um, and white flowers, and leaves are kind of rather rounded or heart-shaped or kidney shaped, some people might say. Um, Here's a closer picture of that carline thistle and a bloody crane spill that I both uh, occurred in other photos earlier on. The carline thistle has flowers that are not like this ordinary purpley pinky thistle, typical thistle flowers. They're more of a kind of creamy brown color. And the underside of the leaf is whitish and the plant likes a calcareous soil, ideally. Um, and that crane spill has big showy pinky flowers and leaves a bit like the leaves of the meadow buttercup. But um, the, um, the, end, the ends of the lobes are a bit blunter. The whole leaf is a bit rounder in its outline. And the stalk, the leaf stalk of a crane's bill does not have something that the buttercup does have. And that is a little groove that comes down from the top of the, top of the stalk quite a way down towards the middle, running, running um, sort of within, within that leaf stalk, kind of along the upper edge of it. So if you're in doubt, you can always check and see if that leaf, if that leaf stalk is, is cylindrical, smoothly cylindrical, right from one end to the other, then it'll be a crane spill, or if it's got that groove, maybe the buttercup. Um, obviously, when they're in flower, it's really much easier. The mouse here, hawkweed, that likes well-drained places as well, and it's got um, uh, oval leaves with very, very long white hairs. So it's really quite unmistakable, and it's pale underneath. I'm going to have to rush on a bit to make sure we get these things done, um, try and finish by half past. A couple of um, the low, very, very low dwarf shrubs, the thyme and the rock rose, both of which have little oblong oval leaves. They're bigger in rock rose and they have a groove up the middle where the main vein goes and the flowers are obviously very different. And they both do best in one where the soil is quite calcareous. So they can feature quite well in some of these coastal cliffy places. Um, and here's some bigger things. Scots Lovage is an umbellifer with leaves divided up a bit like um, ground elder or angelica, but redder stems um, and a bit stiffer texture, rather shiny. And the rose root is literally a giant stone crop with big heads of, um, of yellow flowers, most common in the north. Both of those and the Scots Lovage most common in the north. And the rock sea spurry, which is on a whole bit more southern, um, has little narrow, rather fleshy leaves, a bit like the leaves of the greater and lesser sea spurries that grow in, in um, salt marshy places. Um, habitat can almost overlap, but the rock sea spurry is very hairy, more than the other two. Um, knapweed, very familiar in a lot of neutral grasslands inland, that goes on a lot of coastal slopes. Um, as do meadowsweet and angelica and hogweed, meadowsweet with the reddish stems and lovely smell. Um, and pinnately um, divided up leaves with a reddish central stalk. Angelica, the leaves are a bit like the Scots Lovage we saw back there, but a bit more divided up. And the whole plant is bigger, taller, with a, a bigger umbel and um, a big swollen basis to the leaf stalks. Um, and hogweed is quite unmistakable as well. It's big and stiff and roughly hairy, um, very good for insects. And the uh, leaf is fairly sort of coarsely divided up. Um, if you're in the south, you might find this yellow wort, which is unmistakable, the leaves on the left and right join together in the middle, and it's got an odd kind of greyish green colour and a funny texture. Um, I'm always unmistakable, even without those yellow flowers. And the greater knapweed looks much like the ordinary knapweed, but the leaves are divided more up into, in, into um, deep sort of pinnate lobes. And when it's in flower, you've got those extra outer rays um, around, around the edge. Bluebell, everybody knows bluebell, although sometimes we need to be sure we're not looking at the hybrid or the Spanish one, the introduced ones. They've got wider leaves is one of the main distinctions. The flowers are um, a bit different as well. They don't droop down to one side. There are some little differences, smaller scale differences. 
um, but leaf width is another is quite a common thing. If it's on coastal cliff slopes, it's most likely going to be the um, the native one. And tormentil that can be very common in these places too, especially where the soil is more acid. Um, little yellow flowers with four petals and leaves divided up into three leaflets with quite big teeth along their outs so that their sort of end parts. That photograph was taken in autumn. That's why it's more of a reddish color. Um, the little knotted clover is a bit like leaves like white clover, um, quite hairy though, and pale pink flowers. Milkworts, um, another low growing creeping species with blue flowers and narrow oval leaves. Two species are rather similar, but the um, if the leaves, if the lower leaves are in opposite pairs, it's heath milkworts, which is the common species in the north. Soft brome has great big flower heads um, or big, big spikelets, quite unmistakable, and it's quite broad leaves and the whole thing is quite hairy, softly sort of hairy. That likes neutral grassy places. Whereas the fleece sedge is a plant of flushed, base enriched habitats and urban places, and that can be on um, cliffy slopes as well as much further inland. Um, the leaves are thin and wiry and you wouldn't pick them out at all, but when it's got the fruits um, ripe, they stick out and they point backwards. Uh, quite uh, easy things to identify. A good indicator of base rich flushing. Uh, the Jazzyuni montana, the sheep's bit, has little rosettes of oval leaves um, and blue flowers, a bit like the ordinary devil's bit scabious. But the whole plant's shorter and it grows in dry places and the leaves are much, much smaller. Um, standard burnets and other things, especially in the south of Britain, you find um, plants of that with these um, pinnately divided leaves, quite well toothed individual leaflets, each one um, on a very short stalk. It likes calcareous places, whereas the sheep's bits are mostly on more acid ground. Um, and the wild clary, especially that, that likes kind of fairly um, really dry soils, and it's um, it's one of these labiates. I don't have a, photo, a decent photograph, so I drew this picture a couple of years ago. And the leaves are quite coarsely toothed. The whole plant's quite roughly hairy. Um, it can get quite tall with these purple flowers. It's a nice thing. Um, and Dyer's green weed. It's like a miniature broom, but the leaves are not in, they don't have three leaflets. They've just got single oval leaves. Um, that's the easiest way to tell that. And the um, rock samphire, unmistakable, really strangely divided up leaves into all these narrow segments and then these pale, dull, yellowish um, umbels of flowers. And the whole thing's got quite a fleshy texture. Um, there's some drawings I did of those. That's before I had these photographs. Um, and the sea beets, I think we're near the end of all these species. This related to docks, um, it's got quite a shine to the leaf. Um, the lower leaves can be on quite long stalks and the whole thing is quite stiff and it can form quite big patches on the lower parts of cliffs, down on sort of stony ground um, on the shore as well. And along the upper edge of the salt marsh, quite, quite a distinct plant, that shininess is a good feature. So, oh, and finally spring squill, it's rated to bluebell, it's a quite a short little thing. I haven't got a photograph with the flowers on, but this one, is after they've um, set up, after they've um, gone to seed. And the, you can see in the background, the sort of rather bluebellish leaves there. It likes coastal um, grassland and heathy habitat, heathy sort of vegetation. Primrose, very unmistakable thing. And wild carrots <coughs> is an umbellifer with these with fringe just below the flowers of um, bracts, long branched bracts is one of its distinctive features. Um, I put in some questions because I know you would like to have a few questions thrown at you. We'll do these as, quick, you know, as quickly as we can. Um, is that if you just think of what you think of the answers and then I'll go over the page and we'll, um, and that's got the same photographs telling you which ones they are. Um, three rather different looking species, different photos and um, so we've got one guess of B, C, and then A. Oh, they're all different guesses. <laughs> okay. okay, I can tell you straight away. Go for it, you tell us. That's correct. Uh, there we are. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Actually, that is, yeah, that's actually what we're getting the majority of. So well done, everybody. <laughs> Good. 
Yeah. See that one that was on the tricky left. for anybody who didn't quite. That one on the left is an odd, atypical leaf of meadowsweet. So I threw it in there. Um, but meadowsweet, you can see it's got little tiny leaflets in between the main ones. Well, that's one of the features of meadowsweet. But that, um, yeah, that's that's atypically divided up. In, in, in more typical meadowsweet, those, those ones, the main ones like that, are just all one thing quite deeply toothed, but not divided up into lobes like those are. So it's slightly, slightly trick on there, throwing that in. Um, is this one red fescue or sea plantain or thrift? I don't think this would be too difficult. Uh, one answer coming in, anybody else want to hazard a go? Shall I page on? So, so far we've got thrift, yep. Thrift, thrift, C, 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 yeah, everybody's agreeing. Um, and these two, just what are they? The Ooh, one on the left, tricky. a bit of a fuzzy, poor quality photo. Apologies for the poor quality of that picture. It was actually zoomed in from a bigger picture. You know that's tricky again because we haven't got mm. any options to pick from <laughs> as well. Yeah. Deliberately, it's deliberately. These that's are good. deliberately sort of yep. a little bit odd. That's great. That's we've got an, we've got one suggestion of sea carrot and a hawkweed. That's kind of close. The one on the left is I'll, I'll page on right so that you can see. We've got some sort of carrot. That's good. Yeah. Wild yeah. carrot. Wild carrot, and the other one is mouse or hawkweed, which is has the most bizarrely long hairs on those leaves in relation to the size of the leaf itself those white hairs are incredibly long that's that one on that specimen that is really pronounced it was in a very dry place um so good thank you for those oh uh negative indicators um there are a few listed as as such um in this npms category hot and top fig is an introduced thing that's only really down south it likes warm place warm a warm climate it's pretty unmistakable it looks it, it looks more, more more like a kind of or as much like a kind of imitation plant as a real plant so very rubbery looking leaves and those funny red or yellow flowers um i think that well that is because it can it it's listed as such because it can be invasive and can sort of just smother big areas. Um, the same the, is for the same reason that gorse and broom and bramble are listed here as M, um, NPMS negative indicators on these coastal slopes because of the possibility they could take over. Um, bramble is actually very palatable to um, um, animals like sheep and deer and cattle. Um, so it's not surprising that it might do quite well on some of these steep places simply because it's not very accessible. So uh, on a lot of steep ground, it's maybe just inevitable that it'll be there anyway, not necessarily always a bad thing. And the docks um, are, are listed as negative here because they are often associated with that kind of disturbance and nutrient enrichments that is not so good for other things. It's not that they take over, although you can get quite big patches, especially broadleaf dock. Um, but um, the, the, an indicator of general kind of um, management of the ground that is not that brilliant for um, for the, the flora in general. So those are the negative indicators, and um, that's that's the end. That's um, that's the final page with a um, a paragraph written deliberately and very pretentious. <laughs> style that isn't normally how I would speak or write. I just took the opportunity to do that in this case. Um, the first paragraph, the second one, not. Um, so I hope, um, hope it's been of interest and some help. Um, and yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Ben. And I can make this um, presentation, of course, available um, to anybody uh, in PDF. Um, I'll also be popping a recording up on the MPMS YouTube channel, but you have actually um, finished with a bit of time, not a huge amount, but we have got a bit of time if anybody would like to pose any questions to Ben. So actually, I've already got one for you here, Ben. Mm. Um, would you be able to please uh, explain the differences between scurvy grasses, please? 
the different scurvy grasses, mm. the, 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 the leaves. So um, in the, the, the main one that we get in these cliffy places, um, they're kind of more or less heart shaped. Um, and then in the English scurvy grass, they got a more of a tapering base. Yeah, um, so more kind of diamond shapes really. Um, and the Danish scurvy grass, which is the smallest of the three, um, they're broad again, a bit like the, the common scurvy grass, but they've got very shallow lobes. So that, whereas in the other two, they're just a sort of even a smooth marginal ramp, but in the Danish scurvy grass, they're kind of ins and outs on a, um, quite long ins and outs. So they're sort of very, very, looking very, very shallowly lobed. Um, oh, great. That's, that's really helpful. One. That's really helpful to, to remember. Um, I just got one more question here. Uh, are these habitats typically acidic? Not always. No, a lot of them are actually most typically they'll be more or less neutral. Um, and in some cases, calcareous, in some cases more acid, but most commonly the soils in these places are going to be more or less neutral, as we infer from from the species composition of the vegetation, that is. So um, if you look at the species composition, for example, of all the different communities in the National Vegetation Classification MC category, MC1 through to MC9, uh, to, to MC12, maritime cliff communities, um, they they are generally they generally have a lot in common with neutral grassland more than anything else. Some a little bit in common with calcareous, some slightly on the side of acid, but most mostly more or less neutral. Oh, brilliant. Um, I do actually have another question that's just been um, added here. Thinking about the position, obviously, of these uh, uh, of these habitats, are sea cliff plants often or quite often halophytes, so salt lovers or salt tolerant species? Some of them are definitely, mm -hmm. um, including some of the more strict, not, not more, fairly strictly maritime ones, rather which are rather fleshy. Like that Quithmum maritimum, they're the um, you know the rock samphire. So certainly yes, but not all of them. Um, some of them that we can get right right down by the coast that are certainly not um, not in that category at all. Some of them, and and that grow um, well well in land like Yorkshire fog and um, yeah. uh, false oak grass and clovers and things. So yeah, some are and some aren't. And the it's ones really that aren't nice. will do best on the slightly more sheltered bits of coastal slopes rather than those that are most strongly exposed to the salt spray. Yeah. So real mix is, makes, I suppose, surveying in these habitats so interesting. Mm. Um, it's a, re it's mm. a real mix. But that's absolutely, you know, that's absolutely fantastic. Lots of thanks. Also a big thanks from me, Ben. That was, that was a very lovely calm really absorbing uh, lunchtime talk thank you so much um lots of people saying brilliant and thank you very much there in the chat um and i can see now that it is half past one so mm. thank you ever so much ben beautifully timed and really really lovely presentation thank you lots of people are saying it's finding it very helpful so thank you ever so much well, thanks thank everybody. you everybody as well for, for joining mm. thank you so bye-bye okay Bye. Bye-bye. Oh. Mm -hmm.